espace cocktail. Thank you very much. I would like to tell you first that this round table about the Identity 360, it's, a, it's an innovation for us. What is our aim? We would like to allow to understand countries that we are not used to know because they are not our neighbors and to discover realities about identities which are very often different, different. These are different cultural practices across the world. So it's not uh, just a, a matter of calling upon official government, but rather identity frameworks, private, public, experts who have uh, international experience in identity for you to discover these other realities. So now, in an hour and a half, we are going to discover some countries and geographical areas. We are going to talk about Austria. We are going to discover a nice system of digital uh, identity in a banking system. We are going to talk about Canada. We are going to discover what is happening in Canada, in some provinces, and also at the federal level. And we are going to talk also about countries such as India, Mexico, and Taiwan. So we are going to discover these together. And for that purpose, I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Antoine Andrieux, in charge of fighting against fraud from iCover Group. Hello, Antoine. Thank you for being with us. And I would like also to welcome Yulia Bantoyou, Head of Identity Services in Austria. Welcome. I would like to welcome François Bédard, who is Senior uh, Innovation Advisor in DIAC, it's the Digital Identity Council of Canada. Hello, François. And Irène Dubois, she's a student in a SPOL. It's a School of Political Sciences here in Lille. She's also the co-founder of Diploma Z uh, Association. Uh, and she's going to talk about Taiwan and the digital identity. Thank you very much. Welcome, Irene. I would like now to start. I would like to ask you to introduce yourself first, François. Would you like to tell something about yourself and the DIAC? Thank you very much. Yes. I'm very happy to be here and to represent Canada and Quebec. Yes, I'm French speaking like, uh, from Montreal. So, what about DIAC? D I A C C dot C A. It's a non for profit making organization. And we are 10 years old. It was created at the request of the federal government after the bank scandal of 2008 in the US 8. So how can you be resilient in the banking sector? In Canada, we have six uh, major banks. So it's not a lot for this market. There is one cooperative also. So this system went on working. So this um, led to something very violent. I mean, for people who saw the what happened to the banking system. Earlier uh, this, um, I mean, a few weeks ago, another bank went bankrupt in the USA. You can see one of my films, the big short that shows the scandal. Uh, so after 10 years, DIAC has some 120 members, and because of the COVID uh, crisis, everything just uh, speeded up a lot. And this is really f exciting to see this DIAC. Uh, I just uh, became a member uh, of DIAC, and uh, well, as a joke, they would say that they were looking for a French speaking, but actually, I have made lots of projects similar to them. So we created PCTF 
pan canadian transfer uh, system between the public and private sector so we work on different technologies and we have uh, of course an economic impact on uh, the different uh, provinces at the different level and even last year, we talked about traceability because uh, the digital uh, identity is the digital uh, identity of people, but also objects. So what is the interest for me? I'm very proud. I would like to encourage you to follow them and their presentations in Quebec. And, you know, I talk a lot. <laughs> in Quebec, we have uh, very many beautiful laws. Last year, through the Law 6, we created a Ministry of Cybersecurity and the Digital System. And in Europe, they said, we, you are just uh, not a lot of people. Why have you this ministry? So today in FIC, there are four representatives of this uh, ministry. Pierre, he is a lawyer and he's a notary. He's not somebody with a technological background. He's a notary. And he is in charge uh, and he works in this Ministry of Cybersecurity. So things are happening. They are here to find means of collaboration, to have pilot projects. At the beginning, they would like to provide citizen based services. Thank you. Merci, Francois. Thank you, François. Could you introduce also yourself and present uh, Payment Services Austria um, in a few words, please? Thank you. Um, hello, uh, I'm Yulia Bantoyu. Hello, I'm Yulia Bantoyu. Um, I'm Head of Identity Services of, at uh, PSA, Payment Services Austria. A little bit about uh, PSA. PSA is basically the uh, Austrian competence center for cashless uh, payment uh, as part of uh, PSA now is also um, part of the critical infrastructure uh, in Austria and is basically sits at the heart of the um, payments um, card and account payments in Austria um, when we look up uh, um, PSA is owned by all the Austrian banks so we offer services for our uh, for, for these banks and the product palette now includes, besides cards and accounts, also identity uh, products. And um, PSA has always supported uh, uh, banks in the dig digitalization process and has come with innovative solutions. And I will just give two examples, which in the past years have been really popular, also on um, international level, being offered by many banks in different forms. And I will just uh, give here two examples, uh, the uh, payments to the mobile phone number and respectively geo control, which is a very important feature, a safety feature for um, payments outside the uh, EU. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. Uh, Antoine, bonjour. Pouvez-vous dire un petit peu? Antoine, hello. Could you say a few words on uh, iCover and yourself? My name is Antoine Andrio. I am a fraud uh, specialist for eCover. We are an international group with nine offices throughout the globe. We want to be locally present to have access to some sources, and we work on um, employment crediting. So we make verifications for people who will be recruited by various entities. We do this for companies, for organizations. We developed also due diligence for companies and people, and we also work on fraud. Now we do 500,000 checks per month. Our processes are digitalized. We have access to about 800,000 sources. And our feature is that we work with 198 countries, so we have good visibility. ID verification is at the basis of a background check. This is an entire process with uh, 
uh, background checks, we comply uh, with the RGPD. And uh, staying humble, we think uh, that we have a good visibility when it comes to um, identity and systems. What we concluded throughout the globe and in the various regions we will talk about today is that some countries are lagging behind uh, compared with Europe, the US or Canada when it comes to digital identity, biometrics, because uh, they have unsuitable supports, because uh, there are failed states, and this is why we need new methods to verify identity. Thank you, Antoine. Irene, can you introduce yourself? I think I'm going to speak in English. Thank you, Guy, for inviting me to this forum. Um, my name is Irene Dubois. I'm the co-founder of Diplomacy at ESPOL. So ESPOL is uh, the European School of Political and Social Sciences in Lille. And Diplomacy is an association, a student association I created uh, with a friend of mine two years ago. And the uh, aim is to present uh, and promote Asian cultures, um, politics, uh, economy to our students, but also to uh, university um, uh, professors. And we mostly cover Far East Asia topics, such as South Korea, Japan, China, Taiwan, and Southeast Asia. Uh, past events include uh, some conferences with specialists in geopolitics um, and diplomats like ambassadors. As for myself, um, I'm 21 years old. I'm French Taiwanese, and I have lived in Taiwan for 18 years uh, before moving here for my studies. And I'm very passionate about uh, digital governance and will eventually continue to pursue this study in this field. And I'm delighted to be part of this round table um, as I like to share some insights from my uh, country, Taiwan, as an example of e-governance in Asia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Um, so we are, we are going to start. Nous allons commencer maintenant. So let's start to, uh, to go more in depth, talk about various countries, and let's start with Canada, Françoise. Could you first set the scene on Canada, tell us about its culture, its uh, um, national structure, its identity? How long do I have? <laughs> So, I'm going to tell you about the transformations which took place last year. It brought about new practices and it goes beyond 3D and artificial intelligence. Recently, a legislative framework was implemented to operationalize services. In June 2021, the legislation 95 involved all our services. It wasn't very covered by the press, but this, changes, this changed quite a lot of things. And then there was legislation 25 in Quebec, it's, uh, it's uh, just like the RGPD for SMEs and the public sector. Um, the deadline is three years, but people will not be ready. And then another legislation celebrated its one year last June. These are legislation which brought about great changes. These legislation were adopted, and today our House budget is 50 million. It's half of, of its budget. So a new legislation was adopted to include the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Cybersecurity. And uh, there is an upcoming bill, 15, to reform the to reform health. And this is a ticking time bomb because it will have an impact on 
the profession of doctors, it will be a total U-turn aiming at increasing efficiency. At the federal level, we also have two uh, bills. Uh, one bill which was inspired by the Ministry of Cybersecurity. So this is legislation C-26 and the, then legislation C-26, which, uh, which followed what was done in Quebec. So the aim is to improve interoperability. These are major changes in the pipeline. And the message I want to convey is that in the end, in Quebec, we don't have problems. Everything goes smoothly. But can we really implement such new services? And what is the economic value of digital um, identity? Because it's true that during the pandemic, there were, there were uh, needs to be met in the private sector. And the private sector realized that if we could authenticate people, we could authenticate driving license, uh, social security, data. And this allows us to reduce fraud. And this goes, uh, this paves the way to questions on inclusion. So it goes very fast, indeed. And now the question asked is, what is the economic value in terms of GDP? It could be between 3 to 13 percent. So in Quebec, we also have companies, state companies, who are using this approach. Hydro-Québec is one example. Or even the selling of cannabis. And all stakeholders will be involved because it will become an ecosystem and it will increase resilience. The next step is to, to use this GDP potential of 3 to 13 percent to understand that we can significantly increase efficiency. When I talk about it in Quebec, I see that my, uh, the people I talk to do not realize the potential. We have many solutions. Thank you, François. Two questions coming to my mind are as follows. First, how can private and public initiatives coexist, how are they structured together, and second, what provinces in Canada are ahead in terms of digitalization? We'll have a guess. And the good news is that uh, British Columbia was also ahead with a digital map. Ontario tried to catch up. Quebec used to be lagging behind, but it looked at the use codes of other provinces and it started thinking about what it could do better to prevent such problems. So Quebec ranked second and it could benefit from the research from other provinces. And the second question was on the private public sector, how it works together. Well, the public-private partnership works properly, indeed, because there are many discussions, and our role in such discussions is to use this uh, reference ecosystem to challenge our members and to ask ourselves what are the real problems of a solution, the problems we have in an organization from the point of view of all stakeholders. So there are discussions, 
And the aim is to deliver a service which meets people's needs. We also have uh, the issue of telecommunication because our country is big and we want to have a direct bond with consumers. So we want people to talk, to speak with one another. And very often I say that Canada is not a, a, a market which is threatening us. People want to do things in Canada because it's uh, easy to do it to then export solutions. And why not in the end? Because with all the technologies, uh, blockchains and so on and so on, of course, it's all about people and we need to have reference framework. So I want to make you understand that Canada is a pilot scheme Quebec is very open to collaboration. I love what my what my government does, but there are true benefits to it. We need to fight fraud. François, I have a question on uh, what you said of this labor laboratory. You said that. Uh, Canada focuses on decentralization, government's decentralization, and decentralized entities. British Columbia has a, a, a register which is decentralized and which uses blockchain technology. So this is very sensitive. And my question is, what are the benefits and what are the challenges in this approach? Well, we could say so many things about this. Please just say two things about it. To start with, the most challenges, the most challenging from what I have seen, is that we have to try and um, and put things into perspective. We need to also have principles in order to deliver services. And what's all sad about this is that the, we don't know whether the skill and competence is uh, in the private sector or in the public sector. And when we started, we were very responsive. So we started doing things before really asking ourselves the right questions. What were the use code that we wanted to have and solve? In Quebec, with the bill number three to reform health and the bill number 15 in the same topic, we will have a lot of upheavals. But in terms of skills and technologies, we need to identify the skills and technologies which will remain in 10 and 15 years. You may have heard of what Quebec said, we, uh, made with said click. Some services were offered. It uses an SAP system. It's not perfect. And in Canada, we had a problem with the Phoenix project, which used also SAP. Many people were not paid. It was a, a huge scandal. And unfortunately, we need to say that these solutions are never perfect. But if we cannot plan the rollout and key messages, because it's about communication in the end, we need to understand that we have to plan, we, need, we have to put things into perspective and ask ourselves the right questions. What Quebec does has had an influence on Ontario and other provinces. But what we see is that very often we want to act too fast. And we need to think about even the return on investment. Thank you, François, for your answer. And now let's move on. Let's go to Europe. 
to Austria, and I'll ask a question to Yulia. Yulia Bantoyu. Hello again, Yulia. Can you also give us a little bit of contextual information about Austria, about uh, the digital situation there, and uh, introduce a little bit um, digital identity? Thank you, Yulia. Um, so I will start with the population. Austria has a population of uh, almost 9 million. Um, I, um, it has a very complex um, history and culture. It has um, well, um, diverse, a very diverse population in terms of ethnicities, languages, religions. Um, I will not uh, go into that uh, at this point. I will focus on identity and um, what I can say here is um, that uh, one can identify themselves in Austria using not only the national ID and passport, but also the driver's license. One of the reasons why I was boarding my plane from Paris and I was like handing over the driver's license. Oh no, it's not. A oh yeah, Oops, I forgot. So. Um, so the, this, there is more um, flexibility in this, uh, from this perspective. And one another important thing is that academic titles in Austria are very, very important. Uh, and when formally addressing somebody, we use also, or always the academic titles. And these titles are included in the uh, identity documents. Another reason I, why I received uh, um, from uh, different countries uh, questions about what's this M from, from your passport? Uh, is it like a part of your name, only one letter? So <clears throat> these uh, are um, important aspects that should be uh, taken into account when, when we think about uh, identity in, in Austria. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, so uh, can you also explain maybe how a payment clearing organization as your uh, chooses to enter the digital identity? And I mean, did you observe some shift in consumer habits in the payment industry that motivates your, invest your entry in digital identity? Yes, thank you very much for the question. Uh, basically, sitting at, as it previously at the heart of the payments uh, in Austria, we can also look, uh, analyze the history and the evolutions here, and we can confirm that basically there is uh, um, an increase in digitalization and also shifting in, uh, in, um, in um, consumer habits. And what we can say is that uh, identity is becoming uh, more important than payments. Why is that? Because we pay two, three times a day normally, but uh, we identify ourselves many more times every day while logging in, while signing a document electronically, while um, yeah, subscribing for, for services online and so on. So um, focusing and offering identity products is for PSA opening a uh, business line, another business line for the future and um, offering these services to our banks um, means bringing relevance to bank customers, more business relevance uh, from the offering that their bank uh, gives them. Thank you. Yeah. So Something I found very interesting in payment services Austria is that they have uh, account transactions, they have card transactions, and they have identity transactions. So this is uh, a, a very um, uh, good, I mean, nice model. So uh, well, how do you compare these different kind of transactions and, and what is the motivation to push EID transactions? Yeah, um, well, I will start with the numbers just to give you an idea of what, what we are talking about here. So when we think about uh, payment transactions, we have uh, in 2022, we had 1.3 billion uh, transactions out of which 1 billion were contactless payments. Um, and in terms of the payment cards in the portfolio that we manage, we have 10.1 uh, uh, 10 million cards, and out of these 10 million cards, uh, 2 million are digitalized. Um, and when we talk about account-to-account uh, -account transactions, uh, the number of um, transactions is a bit smaller, but uh, sev uh, 762 million um, clearing transactions, so between, between bank accounts. And uh, when we talk about 
identity, uh, we have 91 million online, online age checks. So there is not so, so a, a little bit, let's say, compared to, to uh, card transactions, but uh, we, we see here uh, a big growth in the future. And you think it's a future, yeah. All right. Yes. Yeah, thank you. And um, so what is your vision for, so you launched an identity, also an identity, digital identity applications called each app. Um, I don't know if I pronounce well, you pronounce it better than I do. And so my question is, is it an application or is it a wallet? And uh, uh, what are the di digital identification tools for your customers? Well, uh, ich app, so ich means I. Um, basically what the ich app is, is the digital self of the consumers. And we can definitely say that the ich app is a wallet uh, in, the, in the sense that uh, the ich app bring, uh, takes information uh, from, from the bank, customer information from the bank, but uh, the user also can add additional uh, information like, for example, a shipping address that uh, they want to use. Um, and uh, we also offer, um, we will also offer a QR code feature which basically will kind of bring the digital identity in, in the physical world by, by, letting a, uh, by, by scanning a QR code. A QR code and uh, identifying yourself uh, that way. Um, but the eHub is not the only identity product that um, PSA has in its portfolio. Uh, for years, PSA has been offering us a, uh, a product called Bank Ident, which basically allows um, customers to identify themselves using their online banking credentials for a specific partner. For example, for activating a prepaid uh, SIM card. And this is done in, within two minutes. Um, and uh, another solution that PSA is offering is the uh, online age check, which is um, very much in use at, uh, when buying uh, cigarettes from a vending machine. Thank you, thank, thank you, Julia. So uh, well, for those who were here this morning, we talk about uh, the um, banking ecosystems and the BeConnect project for a federated uh, enrollment. Um, so this would be a question I would like to ask you also, um, Julia, is why banks as ID providers and what is the each app, how, how will be the onboarding process uh, and what will be the positioning? Well, let's start with, uh, with some uh, statistics. Um, I love <laughs> statistics personally. So 72% um, of people in Austria already use online banking, so they are already online. Um, added to that, 83% of Austrians um, trust their banks. So this high trust was what the bank offers is, done, is actually very uh, trustworthy from this perspective. Um, moreover, banks um, do are obliged by law to do very strict identification, KYC processes during the account opening. So we can leverage on, on this effort and uh, we can then bring them and offer the users the possibility to use this information, which was uh, checked and, and uh, use it in different uh, use cases. And last but not least, we have seen already, I think you already know, or you already know um, all the uh, success stories from the, from the Nordics, where uh, banks basically um, are behind uh, a very successful EID solution. Um, regarding the onboarding uh, for the eHab is, is basically downloading the app, uh, activating it with your online banking credentials, and then you can use this application for authenticating yourself uh, a, different, a, a different partner. So in two minutes from the start, you can, uh, do, you can uh, take advantage of all the use cases at all the partners of the eHab. And as in so, terms of maybe a little bit of, of the positioning of the eHub, what we want the eHub to be is basically the digital self of the consumers and um, uh, helping them support like a, an, an assistant, an, a, a daily um, assistant that uh, makes the day-to-day -day life easier for them. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. Uh, please, if you have some questions, uh, please note them because we want all the speakers to express themselves and, and after you can ask your questions. Si vous avez des questions, merci de les noter. On les prendra à la fin. Uh, if you have questions, uh, feel free to Andrieux. note them down Donc, uh, je, so that we ask speakers later on. Antoine Andrieux, we talked about mature states like Canada, like Austria. You have a lot of experience in countries where identity is much less mature. So what is the situation in those countries? What should we do to verify attributes and data and more broadly, information relative to people. Your company makes a pre-employment screening, so it, it verifies pre-recruitment in many countries, so you have a lot of experience. So what can you tell us on this? Well, yes, because um, as you may have noticed, I, am, I do not come from India and from Mexico either, we have a category of customers who come more from the US and who work as middlemen. They make ground, ground check, so they provide verification for companies, mainly for multinationals who want to recruit. And this is why we have a, a, a perfect position for people who will be recruited in Georgia, in uh, the UAE, in India, and so on and so forth. We have to come up with one-stop, one-shop solutions, and therefore, we were bound to develop verification solutions uh, on the basis of technologies and on the basis of people as well, human solutions. And what we have seen on the various ver verifications that we need to carry out using ID cards or passports, we see that there are many discrepancies between states. When it comes to identity, to e-ID, we see sovereign apps, and in everything that was developed, we have seen that many countries, especially in Latin America and in Africa, made a huge leap forward. They went from governmental services with secure access and uh, the use of IDs and uh, mobile phones. In some countries, this is very easy, simple, secure. Uh, in the UAE, it's easy. You have a state which controls uh, phone providers and everything else, so it's easy to verify. Uh, you can also use biometrics with chips. So you have a, a lot of levels of verification. And then there are countries where it's much more complicated because they do not have the same level of maturity. But globally, we see that even in countries which are in difficult continents, that due to COVID and due to the need to digitalize services, we have seen that technologies have known a huge leap forward. And what we were stricken to see was also that um, the GDPR served as a guide de, 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 as a basis. De, de redonner le pouvoir, uh, All stakeholders want to uh, give more en fait, control to, ces, uh, to voilà. the people themselves and more sovereignty on data. Alors, il y a un there is one country which is really impressive. It's India. India, more than one billion inhabitants. And this year, India is really the, has the highest population in the world in 2023. Everybody has heard about Adar program in India. It's beyond one billion uh, members. So in 
a country with so many regions, so many languages. It's so complicated. And you have this experience. What can you tell us about this? India is really a fascinating country. We do lots of checks. It's very dynamic for, the, for employment. So let's talk about this program. It's a biometric program for um, creating biometric file, which is not based on civil register. Because civil register in India, I mean, lots of people have never been to a civil register. Or maybe they should do some tens of kilometers to see some civil register. This is the reality of the country. So people are excluded. So the government in India said, well, we are going to work with Idemia, it's a company, and they are going to go across India with different uh, agents, and they are going to scan scan the uh, um, fingerprints, take pictures to write down their names, surnames, and when people could justify with a civil register document and a date of birth. So they created an ad hoc file with individuals, and some of them had never had any even a certificate, a birth certificate. And ADAR is linked to a card. It's a plastic um, Card. Several documents in India can be really identity documents, for example, a driving license, you have a TIN card, Madar card, and all these documents are legitimate if you want to open your uh, bank account. They are in plastic with information which is really basic information, name, surname, number of the identity document, date of birth, because sometimes, unfortunately, sometimes people don't have, don't know their uh, family name. Sometimes you are going to, for the date of birth, you are going to have something theoretical. So checking identity is really a huge task. What do they do then? Well, they try to do their best. There is this possibility in India to have access to governmental sources, uh, beyond the fact that the identity document can be checked, of course, visually with all these limitations, and you can also do cross-checking on different registers between the people who vote, the register, the register of taxpayers, and the LADAR. What is the concern? In LADAR, it means seven euros, that is to say 500 rupees, so it means that you have to access to a government agent if you want to have a card, and it's going to be in a database with another different picture, there could be some fraud. So once again, there is a gap, and India is the only country in the world where the passports of the world has no chip. So authentication of the document, it's an issue, an important issue at stake. So we have to be pragmatic, you have to take the document, and through different cross-checkings uh, on different registers. So we go to another continent, maybe we can talk about Mexico. It's an e you have more than 100 million inhabitants. On the one hand, you have organized crime, which is very strong. And on the other hand, you have integration um, challenges with the U.S. economy. How do you do against such a background in Mexico? It's the same. In this country, we got the, the document themselves. They have a plastic document, and there is no chip, at least for identity document. 
Uh, beaucoup de pays, en fait, dans le monde, in very many countries, they just use your civil register or the, um, if you people go to vote, for example, in another country, they created a biometric program and they provided a document which was safer. To have a safer vote. In Mexico, it's the same. You have people who went to the civil register to get identified, then there is a biometric collection of the fingerprints, then they take the picture of the individual, then the biometric analysis of the face with different checkpoints, check, and then everything is registered by a database. And it is by the uh, national institutions of the voters. So it's a document that you can um, forge very easily, of course. They send a lot of people to the USA, and if you want to have a forged identity document, it's just 1,500 US dollars. So you, have, you can get an identity document for 1,500 dollars. It's not necessary for forging things, but young people, or lots of people, are going to put the actual data, with the exception of the date of birth, because they want to get alcohol. So for 1,500 euros, you have identity document where you have some uh, data which are true, and some of them which are not, and you can also buy some elements, uh, uh, some safety elements uh, from China, for example, hologram. You can receive this by postal mail. In the same way, they are going to do cross-checks between a visual document, two algorithms, so it's really a basic check, and you can do it with the UNEC database to just uh, get some information. For example, geographical data, where the person has to vote, for instance. Is it the same as the, uh, their address that they have um, declared or not? because you just have a registration office for their for when they wanted to vote. So these are the methods that we use. Maybe the last question. In Europe, we talk about convergence, interoperability, but what about the reality across the world? There are lots of specific features in the world, lots of uh, uh, measures, customized measures and specific features, cultural features. What about the future? Do you think that we can have some convergence um, as to the digital identity? Yes, there are convergence standards, biometrics, and the fact of providing chips to identity documents to just provide people to be able to be authenticated rapidly and in a safe manner, I think this standard is going to become a world standard. We have apps, we have telephones, but not everywhere. You ask somebody in India whether they have a document with, to show it through their telephone, it's not necessarily going to be the case. So you have to think also about a local uh, economic reality. We have to work on a common standard, and the governments are working on that. We talked about this earlier on. The states are afraid about something, and the different uh, players and stakeholders as well, is that you cannot have a sufficient interoperability between the different states and the stakeholders, and the GAFA are going to swallow you because they have access 
through their own devices, for, for example, Amazon or Apple. Uh, lots of people have a Netflix or Amazon uh, account, and they might uh, get these sovereign identities and propose a design. So there is a, there is a need to go towards this uh, convergence. I have no crystal ball, but I think there is a need to work in a joint manner and to collaborate. Somebody was telling me that regarding the mobile apps at the international level, there are two stores, either iOS or the either Android. There are two shops that control all the apps, either it's your friend or your enemy. And what is Apple is doing in the United States, in some places, because it's Goldman Sachs behind it, Apple in some of the states is a bank, because you just get together, you do business, so you open a bank. So as we were saying, is it too late? Is it too early? But what can we do about these uses and for the digital identity? It's more than a login. There is a responsibility and there are also benefits. You have two stores, don't forget that. If our specific features, and we come back to this uh, telephone, in one year this telephone is going to be too old and totally obsolete. What is going to remain for us? We must say Big Brother is watching us for 50, 50 years. <laughs> How can we change our society in order to become more efficient? This is my question. Thank you very much, François. What about you, Irene? Could you give us some information about Taiwan, about the identity situation, the information, also the, the way that democratic society and technology progress together in Taiwan? Thank you. Yes, of course. Thank you for your question, Guy. Um, so Taiwan is located in in the south uh, southeast. No, South, Southern China Sea, and it's an island, uh, a country. And to talk about a little bit about uh, the historical context, um, there was the Japan rule from 1895 to uh, the end of the Second World War. And then you may know that in... Um, uh, in, in, at that time, uh, there was a civil war in China, and the KMT that was defeated by the Communist Party fled to Taiwan and established an authoritarian regime, which was later abolished in 1987. So there's a really close link between, um, between Taiwan and Japanese and Chinese traditions. And as for the economic part, uh, the last 30 years of this uh, 20th century was very, um, let's say, miraculous, because what is known as the Taiwan miracle is that we have witnessed massive industrialization and democratization together. And uh, that was the moment where the, um, our largest uh, semiconductor uh, manufacturer factory was f uh, founded. And so the evolution in the digital space has prompted evolution in the democratic space and vice versa. Uh, and the two have even come to share a similar ethos. So to give a little bit of statistics, like Yulia likes statistics, um, today we have uh, 24 million people in Taiwan. That's close to the population of Australia. And in terms of surface, uh, we're very close to Belgium. So just to picture that, imagine Australians in terms of numbers in Belgium. <laughs> and in terms of economy, uh, some data. So the nominal GDP is around uh, 750 million US dollar. So it's close to Sweden and Poland. And it's a quarter of that of French GDP. Thank you.
un quart du, de, à peu près du, du PIB pays. français. One fourth of the French uh, see, um, so GDP. Uh, it's not digital identity, but it's very important. Is uh, uh, le Taiwan has gained a leadership in semiconductor industry, especially in nanologic component. Uh, it's a key for the digital economy. And in 2030, the value of the chips market is 1,000 billion US dollars. It's huge. And the US has just promoted um, a chip act to foster the, that industry in this domain. And the question is, um, Taiwan is the world leader in its domain. So how can you explain a bit this success in this industry? I put you some slides here, so yes. maybe, yeah. Thank you. Um, so to explain the success story of uh, TSMC, I would say it's largely uh, linked to politics because the government uh, has uh, supported this, um, this company for a long time and also because of the uh, business strategy. So TSMC uh, will produce silicon and uh, microchips uh, for, for example, two rivals, uh, for instance, NVIDIA and AMD and also Apple and Qualcomm, and uh, which will compete in the graphics card vertical, but TSMC is the main manufacturer. So all the competitors go to TSMC. I mean, most of the competitors go to TSMC and that's what may explain the success. And also um, just to make a quick point, uh, TSMC was long gone unnoticed because the semiconductor that maybe we can find if you have a iPhone 11 you you're using TSMC um, microchips because um, it has long gone unnoticed because they're designed and sold in products that was branded so like Apple and a lot of other in brands other and brands. yeah oh, okay it was a little bit hidden so it's a very um, uh, technol uh, very good technological edge for Taiwan. So uh, there are many specifics about identity in Taiwan. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about the practice for identification, authentication, authorization? And uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about the specific registries, cultural registries in Taiwan for the household, and also maybe how we can change name in Taiwan, for instance which has very uh, interesting stories, I, I believe. Yes, um, Taiwan has really great, astonishing stories. Um, I'm really glad you asked this question because just two years ago, uh, I was in Taiwan because of COVID in France. And um, there's a very surprising story at that time. So um, there's a restaurant in Taiwan, a sushi chain, that ran an advertising uh, campaign revolving around salmon sushi. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, on March 15, so the, the Japanese restaurant began advertising and came up with the idea of, oh, if you have a name that sounds close to salmon, Guiyu, then you have like a, a reduction, like you can, you can eat for free and a lot of salmon sushi. So of course at that time, Taiwanese were were so so um, so motivated by this campaign, and they start to want to change their names, literally. And you know, within a week, guess how many people changed their names? You know, 300. And um, they they paid a small fee of three dollars uh, to legally change their name. So that's, I think that's very interesting to come um, to to talk about, and. Why do we change our names? Why, why does uh, legally we can change our name? It's really linked to our culture. Uh, when you give a name to a baby, you don't want to name it, you know, like uh, you really want to have a signification. So that's why sometimes I have, um, we have some Taiwanese people changing names, even, I don't know, like 12 years old, 13 years old, they want to change their names. They're really attached to the signification but more seriously about uh, authentication and authoriz authorization, um, I asked the Minister of Interior how it, how it works, and they told me that they deliver certificates 
and other means to access public services. Uh, like in 2003, the Taiwanese government implemented um, citizen digital certificates as an identity um, verification for many online services. And uh, there's a lot of ministry and a lot of services that participate in this program. And uh, just recently, last year, um, a mobile generation called Fido, so the one you can see on the screen, um, was implemented and is the software version of the one we had uh, t uh, 20 years ago. Okay. And let, let me just yeah. wrap up for the French speakers. So, yeah, depuis 2003, une carte... In 2003, there was a digital identification card and there are many services of government which are attached to this and since last year there is a new generation on mobile of uh, software uh, digital identity. I give you the floor back. Um, and another quick point about culture is that actually um, although Taiwan has a lot of cap capabilities and Ha is able to actually have a new system of identity, we still choose to preserve some of our culture. So as I said before, the historical context made us really close to, to the Japanese and the Chinese cult uh, culture and tradition, and we still use uh, seals, so les sous, les tampons, to, uh, to do paperwork. And uh, even sometimes, because I'm in France, my parents are in Taiwan, they ask me, oh, did you bring the stamp with you? Or did you bring the, the seal with you? We, we, we have to use it for, for some paperwork in Taiwan. So uh, I think that's a very interesting point to, to talk about. Yes, the le foyer, les sceaux de la foi, du foyer, on appelle ça. Les sceaux. And thank you. So it's the household uh, stamp. I'm going to ask you a new question, but I just wanted to tell you that if you want to ask some questions, in three minutes, I give you the floor. So if you, si vous avez des questions à if you have any questions, please get ready. In three minutes, you will, I will give you the floor. From e-government to e-governance, e e uh, there is a kind of very strong civic participation in Taiwan. And there is a growing cooperation between the government and the civil society. So, uh, what was, uh, why is it so remarkable in, in Taiwan and what was achieved in, in building this digital society? Could you tell us, Irene? Yes, um, so as I said before, democratization goes hand in hand with uh, industrialization and economic development. And in, we witnessed a transition in our way of doing in the philosophy, the government's philosophy, um, from pull to push uh, approach. And uh, in contrast to with the previous one, the push model um, proactively identifies the need of citizens and delivers services straight to them without waiting them to request. So this actually enhanced democracy and also all the bureaucratic process uh, to be more efficient and to maybe illustrate with two examples. Um, in 2015, uh, um, Taiwan's civic hackers community uh, implemented and organized uh, um, a collective called uh, Gov Zero and they, they really want to uh, put some initiatives under the spotlight. Uh, one of them is V Taiwan and it's used to identify societal uh, consensus around controversial issues, uh, such as maybe uh, Uber regulations. And uh, the other one is called Join. It's an um, e-participation uh, platform, online platform where citizens can vote and uh, suggest some legal changes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So very do good, very example of platforms where the government interacts with the citizens and they define some practical rules uh, for uh, different kind of health, transportation or other subjects. Merci, Irene. Uh, 
Thank you very much. Do we have any question in the room for our guests? Uh, we'd like to give you the floor. Thank you. I, the use of identities in Austria. So for you, Mrs. Bantoyu, uh, once I was chatting with a person working for the government in Austria, and uh, she told me that in the public sector, so the government, uh, the identity of a same person in different ministries, it's different, and it's complicated to link two identities together. It's a process that will need authorizations, etc., to link identities of a single person. And it was optional for the, pri uh, for the private sector. So uh, the question is twofold. Was it, is it precise what I have just said? And the second question is, is it really taking place or is it the trend to have this in the private sector as well? That means if I buy something in sector X and buy something else in sector Y, the, the payments cannot be linked. Thank you. Imad, Yulia, do you understood uh, uh, well, the, the question? Uh, I will try to answer the first question and maybe we go to the second question uh, afterwards because okay. the, I did not understand very well the second question. So uh, it is, there is an uh, EID solution uh, from the Austrian government which is used in uh, some of the uh, governmental use cases. Um, at this point in time, the solution uh, only uh, has the, the name and the, the, birth, uh, the date of birth available. Uh, and, um, and more recently, the, the um, address, so the domicile of, of the person. Um, and uh, the idea is that so there are not all the information that the government has are in, in this EID solution available. Uh, and therefore, so yes, I, I assume I cannot talk from the, uh, in, in the name of the Austrian government, but um, uh, from what I have uh, understood, they are working on um, connecting the different uh, databases okay. already. Uh, could you please repeat the second question, if so the answer was... I was wondering if this is reflected also in the private sector. That means I can use different identities for different payments. If I go to one shop, I can use identity one and pay something. If I go to shop two, I use another identity and pay something. This is a little bit the reflection of what's happening in the government side. So, so maybe, Julia, just uh, if I understand correctly what is, Imad is saying is... For instance, if you have transaction from different sectors, for instance, one for the health sector or one for the uh, financial sector, will you use, uh, although you are in the private sector, will you use different identifiers uh, for these respective transactions? We, at, with the EHAP, so... Or, yeah. For instance, so, which is No, it would be one. So basically, also in, at European level, you, 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 you recognize what is basically the data, the stores, for, for that specific data information, what is the uh, the real data source of that information? And then you take that. And thank you. Is that, thank you. Is that right for you, Imad? Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have other questions in the room? Please raise your hand. Um, no questions, so... Uh, if I may... I love the story of the Taiwan in becoming industrialized. It's really huge. Sometimes you should look at what is happening already. You should see the weak points and the strong points of the market. Four weeks ago, there was a story in Canada. We would welcome in Canada a president who is called Joe Biden in the parliament in Ottawa and said two magical words, good morning, Canada. The press really said, wow, Joe Biden says, hello, Canada. What he was doing was to show that the um, supply chains has been, have been requested and a kind of economic sovereignty should go through microprocessors. And in Quebec, there is a region which is called Bromont, 
and IBM has a microchip um, plant. Mr. Biden said Bromo four times. Four times. And the press said, wow, wonderful. He just said, I think that in your your government has uh, is, is more advanced. So this value chain really uh, was distorted. But sometimes a small device is a door for something that can be really threatening. It's hardware. Do not underestimate what can happen after that. If it's not expensive, sometimes there is something which is opening behind. So we have to be very critical. Are these laws that can protect this? I think that we have to have an exercise of governance so that our, our governments become efficient. And citizens should be at the core of it. And it's a generation-based uh, project. Yes, this is one of the issues at stake for the e-wallet. With one single wallet, you will be able to trace the purchases of a person, whether they have been to a government service, all the life of one single person. So you open this, all these possibilities. We have to ask ourselves these questions. Peut-être justement parce qu'on arrive au terme de notre, de notre session. Est-ce que chacun d'entre um, vous pourrait dire deux, trois mots de conclusion This is almost uh, the end of our session. So I'd like each and every one of you to say a few words. Uh, what do you want to convey to the audience Well, I want to give one word. Collaboration. That's all. Thank you, François. Antoine well, Quite simply, this is the world we live in, and we need to remain very humble when it comes to checks. Today we have a very technological models, some models which are very technical, but which cannot be used, really, and we need to, um, to have an open mind to realize that there are different types of identities, there are different ways in which we can verify identities, and there are many models, and we need to be able to navigate between them. Thank you, Antoine. Yulia, that you would like to share with our audience. Um, yes, uh, thank you. So um, I also have one. Uh, three words and then I will just a little bit expand on it. So digitalization is here. Basically, we are living in a world where digital natives are the majority. And at this point in time, basically all parties recognize the need of a digital identity. So everyone agrees. The um, companies want to know who they are dealing with. Um, people want to gain control of their uh, personal data. But at the, end of, at the end of the day, however, um, basically the, uh, the success of an identity solution relies on how often you will use that solution, so day-to-day -day use cases, as well as a very good usability. So user experience is a very important aspect in the success of an EID story. User experience, the key to digital, good digital identity. Thank you, Yulia. Thank you. Um, Irene, um, can you tell us a word of conclusion also for your uh, exposé? Um, as a way of a conclusion, maybe the salmon story, it's quite fascinating. And I think it's also very important because I uh, am studying in a political science school, and I think that we need to focus on uh, people's needs. As Yulia said, we are more and more to live in a digital world, and we see that people want the government to come up with, with customized solutions depending on their needs. I think it's very important, and we need also to focus on, to focus on democratic values. And there we can also learn quite a lot from Taiwan. Thank you. I'd like to thank you all for sharing your beautiful experiences.
Voilà, on peut like to be here, please take a euh, seat. nos échanges avec, euh, autour de euh, l'identité numérique, euh, évidemment, pour cette quatrième édition de la Forum. On a évoqué ce matin euh, pas mal de sujets, un début d'après-midi également consacré très riche, et puis on continue. Cyber security à présent, conference. Euh, on bascule uh, dans le niveau européen, to. qui a And déjà été abordé un petit peu, on va y revenir. Et on a le plaisir d'avoir à nos côtés Eric Van Zuren. We have Eric Van Zuren with us. En un mot, alors... And we are Vous delighted avez eu to. beaucoup, beaucoup d'expérience, mais peut-être que celle qu'on peut retenir, c'est cette expertise maybe, hein, dans l'identité uh, numérique pour les Pays-Bas, la Belgique, what, um, auprès de la Commission européenne. Uh, Vous avez notamment uh, travaillé, bien sûr, avec Daniel Dusseuil, et je, je cite son nom, parce qu'il devait être avec nous aujourd'hui. Uh, voilà, malheureusement, petit problème de santé, il s'en excuse, ne peut nous rejoindre, mais on va prendre ses échanges avec vous, Eric, puisque vous avez travaillé d'ailleurs avec lui sur cette European with him on, uh, on uh, this on uh, European si digital vous identity framework. So maybe we can start on this basis. Oui, and donc, uh, can you tell uh, us what it means, uh, what it is? Excusez-moi, messieurs, dames, voulez bien vous installer, s'il vous plaît? Ladies and gentlemen, can you please take a seat? So with Daniel, who broke his arm, so he couldn't be with us today, we worked in the past with a pro on a project, a European project, which was very interesting, because against this backdrop, we have tested with the various EU member states a model where we were able to exchange certificates and give identities among sources to approve attributes and certificates such as diplomas, driving licenses. And this went all the way to the e-wallet, an e-wallet which allows users to exchange this with service providers. What are the specificities of this model, of the uh, European framework? It was based, based on two major technologies two technologies which are less known, the verifiable credentials in 2023, W3 verifiable credentials, and from then on we were able to, um, to work with very difficult certificates, for example, diplomas where there are three signat signatures, Simple cases like a driving license where uh, there is a signature of uh, a ministry. In some countries, the police needs to sign your driving license. Uh, in payments, there are two parties who sign a transaction. So these are the use cases. This was uh, one of the technology. And the second technology was the SSI technology, the sovereign technology where a citizen can use digital identifiers or pseudonyms. So in this SSI technology, we can have several pseudonyms and we can say while talking with the government, we use one pseudonym, while talking to our bank, we use one pseudonym, when talking, when talking with, with with Air France or a company or business, we use another pseudonym. So it was quite an innovative project because we have proven that we could customize identities with verifiable credential and we sh have shown that we could use pseudonyms. To give you one concrete example, using such a model, it's very easy to send a proof that we are over 18 without having to show our exact date of birth or our exact name. Uh, you simply have to to show a certificate saying that you're over 18 years, and then with your wallet, you prove that you have control over 
the pseudonym. So for me, this has vast potential. It's quite complex, but with privacy by design, it's possible. Les quelques impacts finalement que vous évoquez sur le ce wallet européen qui est au cœur des enjeux concrets impacts que vous pourriez partager. With this e-wallet, can you also share other examples of the impact of the e-wallet and talk about European news? Well, the link between the pilot scheme and the European Digital Identity Wallet, on which we are working on, takes place at various levels, and I'd like to give you three examples. Already in the past, when there were discussions on the EIDAS, there was already a pilot scheme between the Netherlands and Spain, where we provided um, we provided Dutch students with a verifiable ID. So the Dutch government gave a verifiable ID to students, and with this verifiable ID, students could have access to universities and download their diplomas, their bachelor degrees obtaining a Dutch university. And therefore, students could prove their identity once they were in Spain, and they could pursue their studies in Spain because the wallet used was compatible with the Netherlands as well as with Spain, namely with the university partner. So a European student card was emitted. It was delivered to students, but it had a different pseudonym to that of the students in the, in the Netherlands. So with the same wallet, students can use another pseudonym to be present in Spain. What we see today is that this technology has been used in one of the four pilot schemes. You have heard in the previous session that we have four uh, large-scale pilot schemes funded by the European Commission, and one of them is what we call Digital Credentials for Europe. It's based on SF and it's deployed on a larger scale. Secondly, DG Employment, which manages standards to exchange certificates in the social sector. So DG Employment is testing various verifiable credentials in the field of social security, for example, the PDA-1. It's a document you need if you go to work in another country to fight fraud. There is also the European Health Card that you all have once you go to uh, on holidays, on vacation in, in, in an EU country, and this is being rolled out further. In this infrastructure, what can be the role of the blockchain to support this trust environment. First, if we exchange certificates and we send documents in, uh, in Spain to register for a course, or if as an employee I am sent to another country and I need to prove um, such and such information, when I send certificates, whether online or offline, to the service provider, we need to verify a few things. 
mon diplôme de l'université If I de give my exemple, diploma, my degree of Lille, Lille how can they know in Spain that there is a university in Lille? Donc, il faut avoir ce qu'on appelle un trusted ledger, so we need a trusted ledger, a trusted ledger or a trusted ah, okay. register tell, uh, where um, we can uh, entity, uh, have a database of all entities who can deliver such certificates. And once we have verified that this is a real degree, we need to verify whether the degree was not being revoked. So we can use, there again, a trusted registry. And the third application is to verify whether the uh, holder of the wallet has not been revoked in case of a fraud. And uh, there again, a trusted register can be used. So against this backdrop, this is um, a point where we can verify certificates, verifiable credentials, and much more to be sure that the data we receive is trustworthy, it, it hasn't been revoked, and it comes from an organization, from an entity which can deliver such documents. And we can also go back in time. Because, for example, I um, received my degree about 30 years ago, and sometimes we need to carry out some research to know whether the university existed 30 years ago. All this will be possible if we have trusted registers. We can use centralized databases, but in the context of SF and DG employment projects, we are trying to have a Merci shared infrastructure oui, based on blockchain. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your expertise and raising these issues. We see that things have sped up. Much progress has been made, but there's a lot to be done still. Thank you, Eric, for being with us today. Alors, je vous invite à rester avec nous pour suivre les débats. Alors, évidemment, Please stay with us to follow the debates également, puisque on and also le cadre stay with us all the people who are with us online. We will talk about the European Digital Identity Alors, Framework. And on va voir ça avec this morning, we talked about, about a difficult birth. So let's take stock of the situation. IDAS V2 is very ambitious, maybe even too too ambitious, and we will try to answer this question with our participants, Stéphane Mouy, Étienne Plouvier, and Romain Santini. Merci beaucoup. Un, deux. Merci beaucoup, uh, Guy. Alors, merci à tous les trois d'avoir accepté notre invitation. Et je Thank dire, you for being with us and accepting our invitation. We are going to come to the birth of the uh, digital European identity framework. So we have here the Romain Santini, who comes from ANSI. Thanks for being with us. And Etienne Pelouvier, business development manager of Worldline, who comes very often to our sessions. Thank you, Etienne, for being with us this year again. We come back to this European from framework. Last year, we talked about this. Some things were just gaining momentum. Some things were not. And already you have talked about this. We talked with our guests this morning because Digital Identity France uh, is interconnected with all the nodes. And we have talked about this, but we have not not really entered into details because we knew we were going to talk about this with you. Romain Santini, can you really have an update about the evolution of this regulation? I 
Adidas V2. What are the main focuses of this item? Thank you very much for uh, welcoming me and inviting me. EIDS, it's a European framework that has existed since 2014 about uh, the capability for a person to show their identity online. These are trust uh, services, electronic uh, signature, uh, having uh, um, an account online. So it means having um, trust uh, in electronic exchanges. We are revising this regulation. The European Commission has put forward an amendment proposal for this uh, uh, regulation. It's about the European framework, on, uh, about the trust services, and there are several major differences with e today's um, EIDS um, regulation. First of all, it's about the approach. In the present regulation, there is a definition of the, reg of the uh, trust. There are different levels, there are different means for electronic identity. There are different means for you. For example, you have a password, a mobile app, an electronic ID. And then the, Euro, the each member state are going to deliver or not these means to the citizens under the whatever model they believe is the most appropriate. There is no obligation. Uh, the only obligation is to recognize the uh, models of the neighbors. In EIDAS uh, 2, the European Commission wants to have more ambition in order to have a digital e-wallet, so to have a European e-wallet, to impose. The idea is to oblige somehow all the member states to deploy these facilities, to provide their companies and the citizens uh, with these uh, European e-wallets and to extend the, the functions. When you talk about the wallet, it goes beyond the identity matter. It recovers other issues. It's a little bit deceiving when we think about wallet. We think there is something uh, inside. We have our social security card, uh, but also it's, it contains, and the wallet, it's it, as such an ID. It's a, it has an electronic identification system. It allows you to uh, make an um, electronic signature, and it includes attributes as well. Maybe I'm going to talk about this into details to show that you are uh, more than 18 years old. You have this contract for insurance, anything close to your identity. So this is the first major evolution. And um, lots of people talk about this issue. So this wallet should be used by everybody and for everything. But there are different other uh, evolutions of this regulation about the trust services beyond the identity, for example, Eurodata, electronic signature. On the one hand, there is a willingness to improve the harmonization of the present practices. So we have eight years of feedback about the first use of this regulation, and we see that there is a little bit harmonization, but it's not the same in all the member states. The European Commission says that the whole secondary laws should become a, an obligation in all the member states. This is a major difference compared to the first uh, uh, EIDAS regulation. And they were, uh, not re they were optional. Now they have become um, of an obligation. And the last change is that there are different trust services which are new. And we see, for example, uh, electronic storage. Uh, yes, we do know this in France already. 
electronic registers. So there is a regulation for of the blockchain. The registers allows you to have different sequences of information, to have a guarantee uh, for their uh, timeline. And there is another issue in relation with the wallet services that will allow you to provide you with uh, certificates. So public providers or private providers are going to show, for example, that you are 18, more than 18 years of age, that you have uh, been present in this city, or that you have this university degree. So this is going to be their work to provide you with these um, certificates. Then there is a more uh, accurate framework of the distance or offline electronic signature. Well, maybe there are too many technicalities, but today, you can see the product. We give a lot of uh, importance to the product. But what about the offline signature? With EIDAS2, we are going to focus on the uh, comprehensive safety of the whole procedure. Thank you very much, Romain Santillon. Maybe we will come back to this approach and the electronic signature because not everybody knows the technicalities of this topic. But this is very important. This is one of the important points. Stefan talked about your vision of this EIDAS2. It's a very ambitious regulation at the European level. Maybe it's too ambitious. What do you think about this? Well, this is the whole issue. Well, now this time we can say that the European ambition is ambitious. Maybe to clarify what I'm going to say, I work on... Well, I, I represent only myself in this forum. I work on the use of digital identity in the framework of the financial services, so for the payments, use cases, and for the payment use, it is identified as being significant. It's not a priority, but it's significant for the digital e-wallet uh, and the uh, EIDAS regulation is the most important use case, the most structuring, the most complex use case, and it needs really a very high level of safety for obvious reasons, of course. We have to recognize that well, not everything is fully decided. The EIDAS text is not fully stabilized. The ARF document is only its first draft. It's going to be reshuffled. It's going to be built little by little. And I would say that it's extremely ambitious to integrate uh, the uh, payment use cases in the e-wallet. So these are very high level of uh, safety requirements. At the end of the day, it's very complicated. Maybe, uh, well, somebody in my family works in this field in the uh, housing sector. In very many regions, we are not able to provide enough houses, I mean, with good prices or fair prices, because there are high levels of standards, but also there are standards of, uh, for environment production. When you look at all these constraints, they are all legitimate. Uh, you cannot really challenge them. You cannot say, I am against the environment, I'm against this or that. The issue is that you add up all these requirements. And for EIDS2, there are rules when you look at the last draft uh, of the parliament, and it was published in February, you have rules for uh, protection, which are very significant, safety rules, which are very significant, 
significant requirements for accepting the digital uh, wallets for very many different activities and sectors. And then you can add the fact that it should be free of charge for all the users. How can you reconcile all these requirements? We will see. <laughs> well, <laughs> I say this because it's important. This regulation is rather positively uh, welcomed, but this is why we are present here, because there are challenges. There are uh, still questions. There should be the decisions should be made, and we have to have a dialogue with the whole um, framework. You do share the vision of uh, Stefan. There are some very high or tricky requirements. Yes, just to give you the background, maybe my own position in this roundtable. I'm here as the manager of Worldline, which is a payment company. We help the customers to accept payments, digital payments. We have more than 1,400,000 business people, and we provide also uh, digital uh, payment means to financial institutions. So we do digitization. This is what we do. And what are the requests of our customers? Our customers want to be able to identify their customers and to s trigger the payment very easily. This is the key point of the request of the private sector today from our customers to make sure to know the, uh, to, to avoid any fraud and to go to the proper domicile and so the EIDAS regulation has been welcomed very positively because then you can have rules on uh, of course trust services to have contracts online this is important so this two regulations has been welcomed also because it allows you to have a European framework with the wallet. It allows you to go further than the mere um, attribu attributes recognition, recognition. It's very important for the business people. And congratulations to Roman, all the member states and the European Commission because they have allowed a definition for this regulation. And then there is this tri trialogue between the European Commission, the Parliament, the Council. Yes, we are going to achieve something by the end of the year. We are going to have a draft which is going to be adopted. This is very good. But a small reminder, this uh, uh, regulation, yes, we need a high level. Uh, if tomorrow I want to cross the border and showing my passport, at the customs, all right. As a citizen, I want to have a high level of security to avoid terrorism, etc. When I want to show my driving license to a police officer, the same. I want to show something which is trustworthy at a high level. To declare a birth, the same. We want to have a high level. Now, do we need this high level? We have to understand that it means constraints for the users. What does this involve? It means you click on an identity check, uh, a physical one, when you travel, for the users, it's not necessarily uh, positive. It's a strong, secure element. And then there is the issue of the deployment of an authentic authentication uh, object with a secure element. The use in a telephone that it's open by Apple, Google, uh, and other uh, Chinese brands to be certified by, for example, national authorities like ANSI, this is not so obvious. This will lead to lots of uh, tensions. Private actors want to enter without having a physical meeting to deploy something, and the wallet 
at the high public level before being deployed by everybody, there will be some time. And maybe today, wallets um, delivered by the private sector, this is allowed by the regulation and it's the same for the uh, um, digital um, identity, for example, of the post at the substantial level. They deliver a service that can be used by business people. Okay, so we can imagine that tomorrow we can have a wallet at the substantial level, certified by ANSI in France. So it means a quality, it's a substantial level, which provides a level of security for the business man. So some tensions can be decreased and it's going to be up to the private sector to manage this risk. What does it mean? What is the risk that I take uh, compared to the user ex experience. Their level of acceptance should be um, rather high. So today our questions as world line and also our business people have these questions. We have seen this morning other possibility. Pierre Chastner from Cartmanke uh, would show eConnect. It allows you to solve the need of being authenticated to a, towards a business people to validate a payment and also to manage the risk. These things are interesting to keep. It's possible to do it today. We communicate a lot about the public wallet. We focus on a high level a public wallet. But in actual fact, there is a substantial part of the wallet which is being created secret. If you go beyond our borders, uh, in the Netherlands, some banks already are delivering wallets which are not certified. At, on the long term, they are going to be certified earlier on. P PSA is going to have an identity app. It should be really as close as possible to IDA certification. So this very private as sector, as uh, dimension, well, the public service is not. Go we are not going to go to be to, to connect ourselves to the, for example, public taxation service. But the private sector will allow people to use this wallet, and then this public wallet is going to be a system of security to be able to use other wallets. And maybe in the meantime, we can use the services defined by ANSI at the substantial level. So for me, the risk which is emerging today is that we want to have very high level with the public wallet, but careful for the other services, because today, what about the questions on checking distance identity at the substantial level to deliver qualified certificates? Today, the regulation uh, authority says this is a good good means to fight terrorism, for example, and to have relations with the consumer, uh, so to check, to check their identity. And tomorrow, with this new regulation, we are going to go beyond the barrier. So there are very many countries, for example, in the Nordic uh, countries, or speed in Italy, there are lots of activities already today. The banks do manage their own risks. This very system should not be broken. It should go on living next to this e-wallet. Stefan, can you maybe add something? Yes, he is talking about a very important aspect. It's the convergence of identity and payment in the digital interactions. This convergence exists uh, and is used by GAFAM, for example, GAFA and Apple, for example, and also 
they promote mobile driving licenses and they do sponsor the 1803 standard. Maybe you have seen that MasterCard announced 10 days ago they provide digital identities in the UK. So there is an actual convergence. Uh, this is motivated by the fact of integrating payment and identity attributes is going to transform things for the customers. And you might develop other possibilities for the customers. So the question is, is this convergence is going to take place from payment wallet for example, like Google or Apple, or from public wallets. The debate is open. We don't have the answer today, but we should not multiply the constraints for the public wallets about the production of attributes. There are also constraints which are important. And what about the profession? How do you see these constraints? Some of them are necessary, but it's a balancing game somehow. You have one of the elements of the regulation. Lots of people uh, think that it's a con controversial one. Article 12b, they say all the key services of economy should accept digital wallets when they have relations with their customers uh, or users in the healthcare system, social security, public services, generally speaking, there is a whole list, and then you have the bank services. And on the other hand, it is said that when you have an authentication uh, demand by, required by the law or a contract, in this case, you can use the digital, the, the e-wallet, and the service provider cannot refuse it. So let us be very clear, the bank profession is really, uh, does not really like this um, because this is going to have an impact on the payment circuits for different reasons. So they have different objections. There are not necessarily bad reasons. There are good reasons for the, about the payment ecosystem. If you integrate this is e-wallet, this cannot be decided immediately. There are very many technical aspects to be taken into consideration. So let us take some time to think before speeding up everything. So, we need clarifications from this ecosystem. Well, of course, I'm not we are not going to ask you all the answers from ANSI. We would like to have your answer, your opinion. Do you hear all the questions from the representatives of this whole uh, framework, their questions? Do you hear them? How do you understand them? What could be the ex uh, what could be expected about the future? Yes, we do hear, we do understand their questions. Uh, there are lots of uncertainties right now regarding the laws. Yes, it's a trialogue, the European Commission, uh, they the European Parliament, the Council, the Member States, they try to see what, which kind of compromise can we reach for everybody. Each one has their own interpretation, has their own ambition. We do support the ambition of the European Commission, yes. It should not be an obligation necessarily, but there is one means for each citizen to uh, be identified and also uh, with the electronic means and also to have electronic signature with um, I mean, it doesn't mean that citizens should are, ha, should have the obligation or uh, should use this e-wallet in a compulsory manner, no. But there are very many different solutions at the private or public level to provide, um, to, to, to streamline the use 
But at any rate, the ambition of this text is that for these use cases, which uh, need a min maximum level of security, but there is no other possibilities, at least we could have this wallet for people to be able to be identified uh, online. It doesn't mean that we are going to replace everything which exists already. Also, the rationale of this text is this. If the um, if the idea is to have a rapid deployment of this wallet for use cases mentioned by uh, Etienne, if we think that each citizen has on their mobile phone their electronic ID, the minds of being identified at the highest level, why should we mean why should we need any compromise in order to have access to different use cases. This rationale means that you deploy this wallet to have access to online services. So the questions, yes, they are legitimate. The issues at stake today definitely is to reconcile this maximum level of security on this wallet. For example, if you use a public service in a state, you cannot ask more than this wallet, the way it's written down in this EIDAS uh, regulation. It's a ceiling. What does this mean? It means it's difficult to reach a compromise on the level of security and trustworthiness of this tool. We do not want to have a massive financial frost tomorrow because we have neglected some of the security levels. If we do not want to have doubts about the sincerity of a voting system. So we do not want to take any risk in this system. As system said it, this is also uh, what Stefan was saying also, we want to have an important safety level in the digital world. For example, in the mobile phones, updated, trustworthy ones, this means security constraints. It could mean also the use of electronic uh, identity card. It could mean uh, certified elements in the telephone. And it really means that you need uh, the, the fact of checking the identity of the person who has this wallet um, offline or online. It should be assessed. And then you have the insurance that the person cannot misuse the identity of another person. So if you are optimistic, yes, we do have the tools in the European Union to achieve this. We have a regulation, which is the Cybersecurity Act, which is the European framework for uh, different services. We have first uh, certification schemes for this wallet. We can certify chip cards. We can certify chi uh, SIM cards, different uh, cloud systems. We can check distance, um, offline certification. We have had this framework in France for two years. There is a first certified service provider. We can see different work at the standardization at the European level. We follow standardization within two bodies uh, in Europe. And we have industrial capabilities. We have high level uh, industrial product producers and also we have the culture of security. So we have the means of our ambition. Now the issue is to understand, and this is why we have these pilots, 
de comprendre bah, pour quel cas d'usage euh, le wallet est which, totalement pertinent, uh, pour quel cas d'usage il l'est moins, les wallets, les wallets are relevant. Partout, les problèmes ne sont pas nécessairement des clous, euh, à un moment donné il faudra s'assurer so, qu'effectivement on ne doit pas servir du wallet pour we tout, not use this wallet for everything. il y a un travail à faire sur les cas d'usage, so il y a un travail à faire sur les cas d'usage, il y a un travail à faire sur ce qu'on appelle les stakeholders, uh, and the stakeholders. Donc, uh, mes voisins de gauche et de droite, so uh, all these people of the panel are going to be part of the ecosystem, to make sure that there is a good articulation. I I'm not really worried. And yes, within a few years, we will be able to meet our ambitions. On the business model, uh, funding is a, is a key aspect, as you know, Etienne. So to go back to payments, uh, first, as Roman said, there are large-scale pilot schemes. We talked about it many times today. And we talked about it with uh, Amadeus as well. We focus on the payment aspect while giving our opinion on the wallet. So, in a nutshell, without uh, giving you our secrets, what we want is to have financial credentials in this wallet. So, your credit card, as we do today, but also your um, your IBAN number. So we want to make sure that uh, we have the right person behind the screen, and we can also try and uh, look to their bank accounts. So we need to get banks involved, obviously, and uh, the legislation has already allowed open banking, so banks need to provide um, IP address, IP addresses. So we have uh, the ability to go look for the IBAN number and also to, uh, to authorize transactions avant de signer avec le wallet un contrat de un contrat de crédit before ça, signing uh, uh, a contract with the e-wallet for example so obviously it shows that uh, some actors are investing on projects on platforms we invest but obviously we are not non-profit organizations we want to make profit so we want to invest and have a return on investments today according to the council of the parliament the e-wallet would be free of charge for users with with free of charge authentication for people as well as for businesses, legal entities. It does not mean that uh, nobody will pay for it, but I'd like to make an analogy because who will pay for it? On the market, it's companies who use it because this will allow, allow them to reduce their costs in fraud. They will have more participation, they will have more turnover, less fraud, and this is why there's a lot of potential for them. It would be worthwhile for them to pay for this service. So businesses are willing to do that. But it involves to implement a business model and will states be able to implement that? Because companies need to accept the wallets of states of governments, but also of various banks, um, national banks, as well as international French uh, banks. Because there will be many wallets. This will all be made at the European and global level. So this is a real challenge for businesses. Will they be able to accept all this? And our vision is to say that there's demand today, as France connected for public services, or regulated services like banks in order to verify identity so we can use hubs but also for to pay all stakeholders 
businesses will pay to authenticate identities. Because here, the one-click payment is what people want. People want to make sure that they will be paid for. They want to make sure that the right product will be sent to the right people in one click. We can do it with private wallets, but we will need a business model. We will need platforms uh, which are interconnected because uh, one sole plan platform will not be able to manage all this. And we also will need a network on the private sector as well as the public sector. So what you are calling for is a private Friends Connect. Yes, a Friends Connect for the private sector. We have the means to launch such initiatives. Should it be made by state or uh, with public-private partnerships? There are some businesses who do it, for example, Signicat in Norway, Worldline's competitors like Nexi, a payment platform, has launched such a platform. So we see that there are needs, um, especially in Nordic countries, which have deployed digital identity faster than, uh, than southern European states. So there is a momentum. This is quite a significant change. And as Romain said, we need to focus on implementing Act. In uh, all countries, all service providers need to have the same criterion to the same criteria. And having binding implementing acts so that all countries have a level playing field, this will be a huge leap forward. Stefan, we will see what will be the solutions. This morning we talked about the B-Connect project, which will be launched, rolled out by um, uh, other players. There is also another project, the payment initiative, to roll out a wallet, which would probably not be an e-IDAS wallet. It would um, provide a B2B, B2 micro B solution. The game is on. They will probably be stakeholders looking into it more closely. Alongside EIDAS or next to it. But what I see, if I may, is that in the work of the EIDAS expert group, the payment use case is not a priority at all. And the technical specifications which were highlighted. How can I say, if uh, it was for payment use case, it would not be the same technical specifications. For payments, you need authentication. You need to make sure that you are working with the right person. You need legal irrevocability so that once you made the payment, nobody can revoke it, can contest the payment, call it into question, and obviously you also need audits so that you uh, can sue in courts. So we can use uh, certificates, electronic signatures, this is all relevant, but the reality today is that we focused more on uh, the use cases of driving license, and the specifications associated to, with it. This could be extended to further use cases. This is true. I don't think that this is suitable for payments, but this is my opinion.
Etienne, I know you want to say something. Actually not. On payments, as I said, we've been focusing on this part, on payments, and we started working with the European Commission and Consortia. Uh, it will be signed in April. As you have seen, there are many players in this consortium, so it's a lot of organization. When it comes to payment, we are looking into it. Uh, when it comes to payment, what's interesting is that now we mainly pay by credit cards over the internet. So we have an approval of the payment. We are connected to an ACS, an access control server. And once you make a payment, you are notified by your bank to, val to validate the payment. So we operate several um, providers. And in Belgium, we worked on a digital identities such as, uh, such as uh, it's me and they want to do they want us to do it because in the future maybe we will be able to use uh, this type of technology to deploy digital identity further so this is one option and credit cards have become widespread. In the, in the end, all this aimed at creating a credit card scheme. Now we have two schemes with credit cards. And we want to focus on account-to-account account payments with transfer, transfers and uh, in real-time payments, to validate it, you need to have it irrevocable. Wallet, la signature électronique d'un ordre de virement, la trace d'audit, la piste d'audit, etc. And ça sont des moyens qui vont, qui pourraient permettre. Mais we have means. Ça c'est technologiquement parlant. Après, il faut embarquer tout le technologies. Technologies to make this possible, but we need to get the banking sector involved. And this is why uh, this is quite complicated. Do we know about the time frame when it comes to the approval? Um, to be honest, it's not up to me or up to the agency that I represent. And second of all, I cannot tell the future. Um, it will. It, it may, may be the end of, this, of the semester, uh, so the uh, Finnish presidency. I think it's quite ambitious, and I'm not sure it will uh, take place, or maybe the end of the second semester. The second uncertainty we have regards the compliance deadlines. We need to agree on uh, what we want, and once all uh, actors, the private sector, public sector providers agree, then we can set deadlines logically. Added with the fact that we have uh, difficulties, we should be able to have e-wallets by 2026, if we're lucky. Thank you for answering my questions. Uh, and I'd like to give the floor to the audience. Do we have questions from the audience? Excusez-moi, on peut monter le son en régie du micro main, s'il vous plaît. Bonjour. J'aurais une première question sur Hello. les consortiums. Uh, I have a question on consortiums. Very often, we hear that two consortiums are 
entreprise suédoise. Are named, uh, for example, the one in uh, Sweden, but we don't hear about the two others. All this is publicly accessible. You have four consortium potential with France and Germany, with the use cases we mentioned. We have the WC consortium where we focus on travel credentials. People and legal entities and payments in Europe. Uh, Spain is uh, um, is uh, championing another consortium, and uh, fourth, you have the Nordic councils focusing on payments, but account to payment, account to account payments. We have Visa with us in our consortiums. One line and Nexi, two competitors working together to focus on, um, on credit card payments. Oui, bonjour, uh, Yves Le Kérec. Hello, Yves Le Kérec. Je suis là en tant que vice-présidente de la fédération. I am the vice president of the federation of trusted digital players, and to agree to support what Etienne said on the use of electronic signatures in payments. I just wanted to highlight that on the 16th of February we had a presentation. Sur quelque chose qui est devenu à KYC Forum. Concept, it's become more than a proof of concept because it's been commercialized in Donc, professional banque, and banking euh, relations. De électronique et de remote signature, donc c'est de la signature électronique, électronique signature à distance, et électronique dans signature le certificat systems, de signature n'est pas sur le poste de travail de l'entreprise, mais il reste dans l'enceinte de l'autorité de certification. Et tout est activé, c'est-à-dire qu'on délivre le certificat de signature et on active so la signature ensuite par une identité numérique. Uh, et donc, using ça pourrait être aussi a digital identity être, uh, le ou and this could be uh, the starting point de ça, ça for bien. other payment uh, systems. It works quite de, well. Dans le cadre des relations and for now très, très it's entre restricted to la banque, uh, very supervised relationships uh, between companies du, and du banks. Mais, uh, on peut it's aussi not retail, uh, but we could retail. also consider voilà. Such a system in retail. Thank you for your precision. I think there is another question. You have the floor. Nathalie Lonnet, Gallic Consultant. I would like to talk on behalf of Soprasteria because I also work for the public sector and I'd like to ask this to Romain Santini. We talk about the future of the European legislation, re regulation EIDAS 2, but there is another regulation in the public sector, the Digital Single Gateway, to set out an OOTS platform. It's the same thing in the end. We voted for it. All countries need to implement OTS by the end of the year. We have specifications with various formats. So there is contradiction in a report made public by the European Commission on the Toolbox Working Group. I understood that we needed to further conversions and that we also needed to find out how we can make this two roadmaps converge, these two standards. This wallet will use electronic signature. The OTS will allow us to exchange with suppliers and Prospects. So how will we streamline all this? Many states are facing a challenge right now. We need uh, to implement wallets rapidly and at the same time we need OTS. So, Romain, do you have more precise information on this? And the interpreter apologizes, but uh, we need to stop 
working today because we no longer have interpreters. Vous, vous pouvez donner des informations au conditionnel romain. Vous avez le droit. Ah non, non, vous ce ne sera pas du conditionnel, du, du conditionnel. Je vais juste pouvoir dire que non, je n'ai pas d'informations. Enfin, je sais que le sujet existe. Je, je sais qu'il y a des discussions sur le sujet, mais l'ANSI n'y participe pas. Et euh, ça va être difficile de faire une réponse plus précise que ça. Merci beaucoup, Romain, d'avoir euh, tenté euh, néanmoins une, une réponse. Y a-t-il une dernière question Plus de questions. Eh bien, merci beaucoup. Merci à tous les trois d'avoir été avec nous sur cette session.